All right. So thank you all for joining us today. Um, my name is George Castandi, and I am the moderator today. I wanted to welcome you all. I hope you and your families are in good health and in safety. I'm really glad that you've been able to join us today. This is a really, really exciting topic. And uh, when we were uh, going through the slides and our dry runs and preparing for this, the case studies that you're gonna be hearing about today are incredibly interesting. I'm really excited to, to, to go through it all with you. Just wanted to just touch on a couple of quick points first. We are going to be doing a Q&A at the end of the webinar, so please feel free to submit questions via the text box that's on your screen. As you can see, I'm, I'm waving my mouse here. And uh, you just submit your questions there, and we'll try to get to as many of them before within the hour as possible. If we don't get your question before the end of the webinar, we promise to follow up with you after the webinar by email. Um, all questions are gonna be addressed anonymously and the webinar is being recorded and will be posted onto our website, LinkedIn, YouTube pages, as well as our web, uh, um, uh, uh, our other platforms. So please feel free to pass on the links to your colleagues. We're gonna be sending links by, by email. Also, we're gonna be sending completion certificates by email. It usually takes about a week or so after the uh, webinar in order for us to get all of the completion certificates. So if you haven't seen anything, by this time next week, send us an email. We'll make sure to uh, give you an update on that. When you close the GoToWebinar window, you're gonna be prompted to answer a few questions um, about the webinar and how it went. So we encourage you guys to please provide us with that feedback. It, it is very much appreciated. Also, if you have any uh, technical difficulties during the webinar, please email us at webinar at origin-and-cause dot com. All right, so I'd like to introduce you to our speaker. Um, today we have Dino Matei joining us. He specializes in metallurgical materials and mechanical failure analysis. He is, has over 20 years of experience and has completed over 2,000 forensic investigations of various metallic and non-metallic components. Uh, Dinu has been qualified as an expert witness in court, and uh, we're very pleased to have Dinu joining us today. Uh, thank you so much, Dinu, and the floor is yours. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for registering, registering for this webinar. I hope you will enjoy the presentations and that you will find the information included here uh, useful. Uh, at the end of the presentation, I will be more than happy to answer your questions if I can. And if I don't have an answer for you today, I will get back to you uh, as soon as I can. So uh, let's get started. I have a little difficulty here with the pages. I apologize for this. Dino, if you click on your picture and then hit next slide, I think you'll be good. Thank you for your help. No <laughs> My IT skills are uh, not that great. You're doing all right. Yeah. Uh, personal injuries. Uh, the sad truth about those uh, personal injuries is that they are happening on a daily basis and they also have a long lasting effect, not only on the injured party, but also on his or her family. From uh, my experience, uh, I can say the most uh, common causes for personal injuries are uh, user error or negligence, uh, manufacturing design issues. Uh, there are certain products which are poorly designed that will lead to uh, a personal injury. Uh, there are also manufacturing defects. That means an internal component is defective or the material which is made of is uh, improper. Uh, major cause for personal injuries are is poor maintenance of tools or equipment. Uh, they require maintenance. Tools and equipment requires maintenance. Uh, it's not that it can sit on a shelf or in the basement or in the garage forever without being looked after. 
Another cause for personal injuries is the installation error. Some tools or equipment needs to be uh, put together by the user. And if it's not done properly and in accordance to manufacturer specifications, that could lead to a, an injury. The diversity of personal injury claims is huge. Um, I cannot cover but only a small fractions of those. And uh, personal injuries are always complex and uh, challenging investigations. How forensic engineer can assist you uh, in personal injury claims? We gather the background information uh, and uh, analyze the, the data available. We put together a testing protocol to uh, conduct examinations or joint examinations or analysis. We review the results of the examinations. We review opposing expert reports. And we make suggestions for uh, further work uh, if needed. We separate facts from opinions. Following our investigations, we discuss with our client. And uh, although we don't offer legal advice, uh, our analysis can help you uh, to expose liable parties and formulate a sound strategy in administering the play. As I mentioned earlier, and, uh, list of uh, personal injuries is rather large. I'm going through briefly uh, some of the ones that we encountered throughout the years. Um, every rotating equipment contains bearings. Bearings fail as the result of improper maintenance and if overheat they, they can catch fire. Axles, drive shafts, again these are moving uh, equipments or machines, if they break, uh, they can lead to accidents. Wheels that came, out, came off, uh, conveyor belts, wind turbines or solar panels, when they fail, either due to wind or a manufacturing problem, uh, flying debris can uh, hit person uh, nearby. We examine hoist and lifting devices, uh, even tarps, uh, although they sound so uh, uh, domestic, if I can say, those little grommets that keep the top together can fly and cause uh, injury to people who are not uh, operating them properly or if the tarp is defective. We looked into food processing, processing equipment, and uh, we also looked at an elevator do door lock, uh, which malfunctioned, and uh, the person entering the, the lift was under the impression that the lift is at that level and it actually two, was two floors down, so that person fall through the shaft. People are buying or renting tools from uh, hardware stores to do some uh, work at home. And um, not everybody is reading the instructions or uh, are accepting to be trained by the people who are renting the tools. And um, this could lead to personal injuries. Uh, it is fun enough to say that most men don't read instructions. We all believe that we know how all the tools are are working and in fact no uh, there are certain warnings inside those uh, installation manuals or users manuals which are put there for a reason uh, they're not put there just to take space or to to use paper um, we encounter cases where grinders and saws cause personal injuries uh, severe fingers uh, knees cut uh, we had a case involving a rototiller which backed up and uh, caused the serious injury to the person operating it, uh, ladders that collapsed. We even looked at uh, roof anchors. Roof anchors are the anchors used by uh, roofers where they can attach their harness equipment. And if those roof anchors fail, then the uh, worker could fall to the, 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 the ground. And one interesting case is uh, a commercial paper cut, which is not a tool, it's a, a piece of equipment, where a 25 kilograms blade uh, came down without a warning and severed the user's uh, fingers. Entertaining and sports and stage equipment can also lead to personal injuries. Uh, bikes, a uh, frame can broke, wheels can, can come off, uh, brakes don't work, 
And in fitness equipment, uh, we've seen a lot of injuries. Skiing equipment, uh, surprisingly, playground equipment. Uh, in this particular image, you will see uh, a chain ladder. Uh, if the chain is not properly made, a kid could catch his or her finger and it can uh, be severed. Uh, we've had investigated the accidents associated with monkey bars, uh, <coughs> excuse me, trampolines. And even now, uh, we looked at a paddleboard which caused lacerations to a person because the surface finish was uh, very rough. And uh, an interesting case involved uh, a video wall uh, installed at a theater, which collapsed during the rehearsal of a play. And also, these are not necessarily personal injuries. They could lead to adverse health effects. And we have been in, uh, involved in investigating uh, contamination of bottle water, uh, aftershave. In this particular case, a person believing he was using uh, uh, the aftershave that he was fine of uh, actually used the contaminated aftershave with, in a bottle with the same lab label, and uh, this caused severe burns to, to his face. Um, and other interesting cases that we were involved involved a pizza oven explosion. Uh, the pizza oven exploded because the granite on which the pizza was sitting contained a contaminant. Uh, which, upon uh, raising the temperature, uh, produced an exothermic reaction. An interesting case involved a pain can handle, where the, the handle broke and caused uh, uh, nerve damage to one's uh, hand. A hair dryer which uh, electrocuted the person who used it. Uh, our um, structural engineering group uh, were invo was involved in injuries as the result of structural damage and uh, injuries because of stairs and guard guardrails. We looked at a few pieces of medical equipment and accessories, uh, chairs, and um, surprisingly a large number of wheelchairs and walkers failures uh, were brought to us. Uh, doors can uh, cause uh, personal injuries uh, if uh, the mechanism are not working properly or if the person uh, going through the door is not paying attention. We looked at scalding valves and uh, we can also investigate carbon monoxide poisoning. Having said this, uh, let's start with uh, a few case studies. I uh, selected a few which I was thinking they are interesting and that they cover a large uh, spectrum. This uh, wheelchair that you see in the left side of the screen was involved in an, an accident. The person who rode it, it was uh, riding it uh, on the street, and all of a sudden uh, he lost control of the wheelchair, which started to catch up speed, and. Uh, there was no response. He panicked. Uh, so during the panic, the the joystick, which uh, operates the the wheelchair, came off, and as the result, he lost completely control of the wheelchair, which uh, tumbled over and uh, landed on top of him. We received the wheelchair for uh, examination. We tested it in our laboratory, we compared it with an exemplar, and we did not find anything abnormal about it. Uh, it was well maintained by the user. However, we noticed that the knob from the joystick uh, exhibited a, a big, big manufacturing uh, design issue. Uh, the knob was not secured in any way to the shaft. Uh, there was no evidence of uh, uh, set screw or evidence of Loctite to ensure that the knob stays in place. The conclusion of our examination was that uh, the incident was possible to uh, design deficiency. And later on, we found out that uh, the user lost control of the wheelchair because he was riding it near a radio station. And uh, 
electromagnetic field created by the radio, radio waves interfered with the electrical motor of the, the wheelchair. The next example is um, about the personal injury who, which occurred to a kid in a daycare uh, setting. Uh, the kid was using the, the toilet when all of a sudden and without a reason, a chunk of uh, ceramic material from the bowl uh, was expelled and uh, it uh, ruptured one of his uh, artery. We were asked to determine uh, what could have caused the failure of this uh, toilet. Um, a ceramic toilet is uh, made from clay, which is poured into form, and then it, it's run into a furnace where it's uh, sintered, or in other terms, cooked. If sintering or post-sintering uh, are not properly done, there could be uh, discontinuities, discontinuities in the material, uh, which will act as stress concentrators. Um, there are a lot of testings that, testing that needs to be done uh, in order to determine why the ceramic failed. We looked at the fracture surface, uh, we analyzed its pattern, then we looked at the cross section to see if there are any abnormalities in the microstructure, and we did uh, porosity tests. These uh, toilets, uh, as per the applicable standards, have to have uh, a certain porosity. There are certain acceptable levels of porosity. If those levels are exceeded, then the part became weak. And this was the case uh, for this particular toilet. Um, the stresses were internal and they were locked in for extended period of times. And uh, they released the energy all of a sudden and uh, without a warning. The conclusion of our investigation was that uh, the toilet broke uh, because of um, manufacturing deficiency. The next example uh, involves a, a chair in a public place where a parent was sitting uh, and he was holding his baby on his shoulder. All of a sudden the chair broke and the child fell head first to the floor. The chairs were made from a tubular steel and uh, they were welded together, the, the sections of the steel and uh, it was the supporting bar at the end that failed at the weld. As you can see on the right image, this is where the failure uh, occurred. We collected the chair and collected uh, exemplar ones, and we conducted the full metallurgical uh, investigation. It must be said that in a welded structure, the weld itself should be as strong as the metal itself, if not stronger. The examination involved a visual and a microscopic examination uh, under a powerful microscope. Uh, it involved uh, evaluation of the microstructures and some uh, hardness survey. These two images are taken at high magnification under the microscope on the fracture surface. On the left side, you will see this black feature, which is a void. Uh, voids are not acceptable in, in weldments. And the uh, white compound uh, is part of uh, an impurity. Again, uh, welds should not contain impurities. The presence of these defects uh, diminished the strength and the load carrying capability of the weld, which eventually failed catastrophically. This example involves uh, the examination of a connected tie rod. We'll see in a right side image. It was a full frontal collision which resulted in a fatality. The tie rod uh, exhibited a complete fracture. A tie rod is a key component of a vehicle steering system as it pulls or pushes the wheel to make uh, the turn. So it's a very, very important component. If the tie rod fails, one cannot control the direction of the vehicle. We were retained to determine whether the tie rod exhibits 
evidence of manufacturing defect or what was the cause of its failure. We cut a section of the tie rod and put it into a very powerful microscope and examine the fracture surface at high magnification. In this particular case, we looked at a magnification of 500 times. For an experienced uh, forensic engineer, uh, these features that you see here, which are called dimples, are associated with ductile overload. That means that the material behaved as intended and there was no defect. Uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, uh, a metal can, component can stretch as uh, a rubber band, not to that extent. And uh, if you reach that, if you're beyond the elasticity limit, the component will come back to its original shape. However, if you exceed that limit, the component will start to be deformed plastically and uh, irreversibly. The ductility shown here is, uh, again, evidence that the uh, material behaved as intended. Um, so the conclusion was that uh, the accident was not caused by uh, a manufacturing defect. There are certain failure mechanisms, and each one has its own uh, characteristics. But during the rehearsal of this presentation, I was asked by George, uh, do you know how that tie rod would look like uh, if it would have failed due to other reason? And I think that was a great question. And uh, here are examples of two different uh, type of failures, uh, each with its own characteristics. On the left side, it's the fracture surface of a component that failed as a result of fatigue. Uh, fatigue is a, a failure which occurred progressively over time due to the presence of cyclic stresses. And other microscope, each jump into the fracture leaves those marks which are called striations. They are typical for uh, fatigue failure mode. The middle image shows what we call an intergranular fracture. This is a brittle fracture and it occurs at the grain boundaries. Each material is made of grains which are uh, which stick together and the fracture can occur at the grain boundaries or through the grains where you see those so-called cleavage facets. This example is about a, a bike uh, which uh, ruptured in two while it was uh, used by a, a kid. Uh, because of the rupture of the frame, uh, the kid was uh, thrown over the handlebars, handed head first on the asphalt and sustained severe injuries. We looked at the fractured bike and we saw that the fracture occurred uh, in a st at a structural weld. And uh, we took a sample and we analyzed it uh, and examined in our lab. On the left side, uh, you will see overall view of one of the mating fracture surfaces. We observe that it is flat and that's raised a, a red flag. And upon uh, looking under the powerful microscope, we observe those striations, which as I mentioned earlier, are clear evidence of fatigue failure mode. By conducting further metallurgical evaluation of the microstructure, we determined that uh, the failure was the result of an improperly made a weld, or in other words, the result of a manufacturing deficiency. In this particular case, uh, a contractor who was uh, collecting scrap metal from a farm uh, sustained severe injuries to his face. Uh, in short, uh, he was uh, collecting aluminum rims and in order to uh, uh, transport them easily, he had to remove the tire and he also had to cut the, the rims in four uh, different uh, sections. He used the 
reciprocal saw for this uh, procedure. Uh, he managed to successfully cut a few tires and rings. However, when he reached this particular tire and rim, uh, the saw kicked back and uh, hit him uh, in the face. He claimed that uh, the farm owner might have introduced some explosive compound inside the, the tire. Uh, on the right image in this slide, on this slide, uh, there is an overall view inside the tire and we collected samples and we analyzed them and we could not find traces of any explosive compound. While examining further the rim, uh, we determined that the accident happened unfortunately uh, by negligence. In other words, uh, the contractor was using the saw to cut through a soft metal, the, the tire, and he did not adapt the cutting the position and speed uh, when he reached the rim. So when he changed the uh, cutting environment from soft to hard, that's when the saw kicked back and uh, hit him in the face. In this slide, uh, we are going to discuss about a very, very interesting case we were involved in. Uh, chocolate uh, contamination. It uh, did not lead to any personal injuries, but it could have led to uh, uh, adverse uh, health effects uh, in the long term. The chocolate maker uh, received complaints uh, from uh, customers about the strange and bad odor uh, in the chocolate. And the number of complaints grew and grew. Uh, luckily, nobody uh, suffered any injury as the result. This was just uh, an inconvenience and uh, loss of business for the chocolate maker. We were uh, requested to look into this case and determine what could have caused uh, chocolate to change its odor because the maker did not change the recipe, did not change the ingredients. They followed the same recipe as they used for, for many years. Um, it is interesting to know that chocolate is the strongest odor absorber uh, material. If you put a, a piece of chocolate uh, side by side with a, a cut onion in the fridge, the next day you will end up with an onion flavored uh, chocolate. We received uh, a few boxes of chocolate and we also received uh, a few samples of the uh, packaging that uh, was used for chocolate, uh, along with some um, chocolate boxes from a different batch. The packaging is made of cardboard, uh, which is pliable, and it's provided with the window, and the window is uh, covered with a, a rectangular piece of cellophane, which is glued on the inside of the box. We conducted comparative chemical analysis of the cardboard, cellophane, and glue. And uh, we find out, found out that uh, the glue is not one of the glues uh, that is uh, certified for food industry. Somehow the maker of the boxes ran out of glue or changed suppliers and switched to a different type of glue, which was not certified for this particular application. And therefore, uh, the chocolate started to absorb uh, odors and become uh, glue-flavored chocolate, if I can say. As I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of accidents uh, involving walkers and uh, wheelchairs. In this particular case, an elderly woman was using the walker, and uh, which all of a sudden broke. Uh, she fell to the ground and suffered uh, injuries to her hip. We were requested to look into what would have caused the fail of the walker. And you can see on the right side that it was a portion of the uh, frame that broke off.
Although it looked like a straightforward investigation, uh, it was not uh, because we had to uh, look into every possible scenarios, user abuse, poor maintenance, or uh, improper use. Um, we looked at the fracture surface, and uh, as you can see, uh, there are large voids throughout. The presence of voids in a mold material uh, is uh, not desirable as it will uh, reduce the strength of the component and its loading carrying capabilities. So this is exactly what happened here. Uh, during normal usage, uh, the frame simply uh, gave way and uh, fractured. There are a lot of uh, personal injuries associated with the use of ladders. Most of the time, the accidents are caused by the fact that the user is not using the ladder properly. He is descending, uh, not facing the ladder, or uh, not opening the ladder enough, or putting on an uneven surface. But oftentimes, those accidents can happen because of a manufacturing problem. In this particular case, uh, we were asked to look at a folded folding, uh, ladder, which was used by a roofer. Upon descending from the roof, one of the hinges, which is, you can see it on the right side image, simply broke. And as a result, the roofer fell to the ground and sustained injuries that left him paralyzed from uh, waist down. We were retained to determine what could have caused the fracture of the, the hinge. Again, we selected the sample from the fractured hinge and uh, we looked uh, under a powerful microscope. And uh, we found these features. On the left side, those rounded features, they represent gas porosity. That means that when the hinge was cast, there was gas entrapped uh, into the molten material. And without uh, possibility to be evacuated, it remained trapped. The presence of these large voids, you can see how large they are because there is a scale on the left lower corner. The presence of this void is undesirable because they act as a stress concentrators and they reduce the load carry capability. On the right side image, there is another defect, which is called shrinkage porosity. In uh, cast materials, oh, when they solidify, if the temperature is not uniform throughout the molten metal, uh, one section will solidify faster than other, and it will create those type of defects which are uh, un undesirable. The conclusion of our investigation was that the accident was possible due to a manufacturing defect. In most of the examples that I presented so far, uh, I mentioned uh, examination. Uh, it must be said that these were joint examinations and involved uh, interested parties uh, like the installers, uh, manufacturers, distributors. Uh, all these examinations were destructive in nature and we had to select and cut a smaller sample to be manageable uh, for lab examination. Use of uh, fitness equipment could end up uh, in uh, personal injuries as well. In this particular case, uh, the user was using uh, weightlifting equipment when uh, one of the steel cables uh, that is attached to the waist and simply snapped. And one end of the cable uh, came towards him and uh, hit him in the face. It must be said that uh, certified fitness equipment uh, is equipped with the uh, aircraft, aircraft type of cable. That means it's a, a stranded uh, cable which is designed to uh, um, take loads, uh, significant uh, loads. 
However, each cable depends on the way it was manufactured or the um, application has a certain rating. Doesn't mean that if you have a, an aircraft type of cable, you can lift anything. Uh, the user of this fitness equipment claimed that the cable was defective and this caused it to snap. We received the fractured cable, which is uh, shown in the left image, and we cut a small sections from the fractured end and we looked under a powerful microscope. As I mentioned earlier, this cable is uh, constructed from several strands which are uh, uh, held to, together. And on the right side image, you will see the so called morphology of those fractured ends. And their appearance is typical for a ductile overload failure. Um, these uh, two features are called cup and cone, and they're always indicating ductile overload. As mentioned earlier, ductile overload means that the material performed as intended. So it performed well until uh, its limitation was reached. If more stress is added, then the cable will not uh, held and they will fracture in this uh, data mode. Our conclusion uh, following this investigation was that uh, it was, uh, the accident was caused by user abuse. Uh, he was putting more weights than uh, the fitness equipment uh, permitted, and this caused additional stress in the cable with the results of uh, uh, snapping. We investigated uh, some burns caused by uh, a kitchen pot. This discolored uh, pot is the incident one and is made from a three sandwich layer or cladded copper, aluminum, copper. So in other words, the bottom of the pot is made of three layers of material. The bottom one uh, being copper, the middle one being aluminum, and the uh, top one is again copper. The pot was uh, put on a stove and uh, the owner went to uh, talk on the phone and she simply forgot about the water left to boil. And when the heat has nowhere to dissipate in the, in the fluid to be heated, it started to uh, get into the bottom of the, of the pot. And uh, the pots are not designed to be heated dry for this particular reason. And because aluminum has a lower melting temperature, it's about 600 degrees Celsius, it started to melt and uh, molten particles were spewing out. And when the owner tried to uh, remove it, uh, she was hit in the, in the chest and upper legs by those uh, flying particles. It was not a manufacturing deficiency here. It was uh, rather uh, user negligence. In the, the left image in this box, you will see some of the molten and resolidified aluminum chunks that were spewed out from the pot. And on the right side image, there is a close up view of the bottom of the pot uh, where you will see the aluminum being, uh, the aluminum layer being uh, badly damaged by heat. This is an unfortunate incident which happened in a, at a dentist office. Uh, during a routine dental procedure, uh, the articulated arm of a dentist chair broke off and landed on the patient's head, causing uh, severe injuries. The collapsed lamp is shown in the left side image and the uh, area where the articulated arm broke is shown by the cursor in the same image.
we examined the fractured arm and we found out that the collapse was the result of a fractured hinge, which is shown in the right side image. And you will see the fractured surface runs through a threaded hole, which is um, a stress concentrator and a weak area. Upon further examination of the fracture surface under the microscope, it was determined that the hinge failed by fatigue due to an improper uh, fastener that was used. So, in other, in other words, uh, during uh, some maintenance procedure, uh, the contractor or the technician uh, replaced the fastener with uh, one that was improper and uh, because of fluctuating stresses like lifting the lamp, uh, repositioning, uh, it was subjected to cycle stresses over time and in the end it failed uh, as the result of fatigue. Our firm was involved uh, in uh, carbon monoxide poisoning and um, carbon monoxide poisoning can occur but is not limited to the following situations. Uh, improper gas appliances installation, uh, lack of gas appliances, uh, maintenance inspection, defective gas appliances, or blocked chimney flutes, or uh, by vehicle exhaust, or like running a car engine in an enclosed space, or uh, having exhaust ga gases coming into the car because of a maintenance issue. We were involved in the collapse of structures, um, like uh, falling decks, uh, collapse due to uh, building of unauthorized structures or additions to a building, uh, collapses uh, of scaffolding stages, uh, failures which occurred uh, as the result of the building code uh, violations. This concludes my uh, short presentation about uh, personal injuries and how we can assist you should you be involved in uh, such an investigation. Uh, thank you for uh, your participation and uh, thank you for uh, your patience and understanding with my lack of IT skills in the beginning. Um, if thank you, you Dino. If you have any questions, I'll be more than uh, happy to to answer if I can. Yes. So we see we see questions coming in, guys. Uh, if you don't mind, you can submit questions in, on the uh, the taskbar there in the GoToWebinar console. Um, I do have a question coming in saying, in the example with the cable break uh, with the weights, how did you determine that the user used weights higher than the limit? That's a very good question. Um, if the user would have used the weights uh, allowed by the equipment, the cable would have not break. The, the examination clearly indicated that uh, the strands broke as the result of ductile overload which again means that the material performed as intended. The only plausible explanation for the cable to break is that uh, its strength was exceeded by putting more weight than it was supposed to withstand. Yes, okay. So you didn't necessarily need to verify like actually looking at the fitness equipment itself to see how many weights were were set in place. You're saying that the physical evidence is here. Uh, having reviewed reviewed the cable, it shows that it 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 had performed as it should. It was just uh, separated due to excessive excessive uh, weight. Is that right? Yes, and uh, I looked, uh, I examined the cable throughout its entire length. I could not find any evidence of corrosion or uh, dents or impact or uh, strength separation. And uh, the f another reason that uh, helped me to determine that it was a uh, ductile overload is that it failed 
at the ear, which is uh, the area that is uh, the weakest uh, because uh, the cable runs through this crimp and uh, it fractured at the interface between the crimp and the, the cable. Cool. Okay, next question. What was the approximate age of the dental lamp arm shown in your case study? It was more than 20 years old. Okay. Um, where is it? It was in the later part, yeah, there you go. You, you can actually see by the design that it's an older design. Now uh, the dentist lamps are more ergonomical and uh, the chairs are slightly different. Yes, okay. Another question, is it possible that the cable was not strong enough for the application um, that, that pertains to the uh, witness equipment? Like, was that the wrong choice of cable in that fitness, uh, that type of fitness equipment? We looked uh, into the rating of that cable. This was an old file. Uh, I don't remember exactly what was it rated for, uh, but it was fit for the application. Uh, but that would be a consideration of yours, right? In your investigation is to verify the um, the the materials that are being used are appropriately chosen in, in the manufacturing and kind of design process, is that correct? Yes, during the examinations, we are looking at all aspects, in, including the choice of material, uh, design deficiencies, uh, manufacturing issues, uh, we compare with applicable standards or with the manufacturing specs. Uh, we eliminate, we looked everywhere and we eliminate uh, what is not considered to, to be the cause of the, the accidents or the, the failure. Yes. Okay. Next question is, what was the heat source for the exploding pot and does the type of heat make a difference? Um, no, um, the type of heat does not make a, a difference. It's the temperature that makes the difference. Um, the user was uh, boiling water and the phone rang and she went into the nearby room and she simply forgot about the pot being left on stove. Yes. Okay, so so the, the source of the heat was just the stove? The stove, yes. It was yes. a gas-powered stove. But the same okay. thing would have happened uh, on a electrical stove. Again, okay. it's the temperature, it's not the the source that caused the caused this incident. Okay. Next question. In the case of the dentist lamp, was the maintenance contractor sued? Oftentimes we don't know the outcome. Uh, I honestly I don't I cannot offer an answer to that a problem. Yes. Um, and oftentimes uh, those legal actions are started later. Uh, at the onset, uh, the, the, the injured person uh, might want to wait a little longer to see if the health effects are uh, long term or if there are any additional uh, effects on, uh, on their health. Uh, but to answer this question, um, after we submitted the report, uh, there were no other party on the table, at least at our table. So uh, usually when um, there is no further joint examination with other party, is either that the matter was settled or the, the opposing party accepted the liability. But again, in this particular case, I cannot offer you an answer. Yeah, I think it's, it's actually a really great question because it actually highlights kind of um, where your job starts and ends. Um, 
when it comes to who gets sued and who gets pursued, that is um, the legal part of a liability claim. Right, so the adjuster, the examiner is typically taking care of the administration of a claim. The lawyer will, or the legal team will be actioning anything that requires the law or liability or, or, or negligence. These are all legal terms that require a legal expert to, to, to execute those portions of the claim. But then the forensic expert has to stay in their lane, has to stick to the facts of the incident and the physical evidence. Is is, is that right, uh, Dinu? Yes, so we have our own specialties, the justice and justice lawyers are lawyers and we are engineers, but together as a, as a team, uh, we can uh, work on uh, all sorts of claims, including personal injury ones. Yes, and, so uh, you can, sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, I'm, I'm listening. I was just going to say, so you know, you can you can advise the cause of the incident and perhaps who the interested parties are, but when it comes to the legal action and the legal strategy, that's something that's outside of typically your scope. Is is that yes, right? Yes. Yes. Um, coming back to the dental chair failure. Um, <clears throat> Our examinations indicated that uh, the failure occurred as the result of fatigue. But if I provide only this opinion, I don't think it will help the client further. They would want to know what caused this type of fatigue. How was it possible? And uh, that's the kind of advice that we can offer, not legal ones. And I have another example involving a, a scalding accident, uh, which ended up with a fatality, unfortunately. Um, it was a, a, a retirement home and uh, the boiler in the mechanical room uh, had, uh, not the boiler, the hot water storage tank, sorry, was equipped with an anti-scalding valve. And according to the applicable codes, that valve needs to be set in such a way that the temperature going downstream is not exceeding a temperature of 49 degrees Celsius. Um, in that case, uh, the valve was uh, not defective. It was improperly set, and also the boilers were not set properly. And um, during our investigation, we determined that uh, technician who was maintaining and operating those equipment did not have the proper certifications to operate them. This was another kind of information that uh, we believe helped the client uh, because we are not looking only at the technical side. Uh, we are also looking how certain tasks were completed by people involved uh, in those uh, accidents. Yes. Okay, I've got so many questions rolling in. I want to get to as many of them as possible. So let's try to run through as many. Okay, so here it is. Um, I'm investigating a few cases of customers falling off toilets in public bathrooms as a result of alleged seat dislodging. The stores are new, under two years old. The toilets are new as well. The bolts are heavy duty. Is it possible to remove? Sorry, it is impossible to remove the seat without applying excessive force. The logical conclusion is that someone maliciously removed them. Have you come across any incidents of this nature in the past? And do you have any concerns or suggestions in investigating such incidents? So, George, can you repeat again the first uh, portion of the yes. question? What was the background? The so, seats were falling. The, the investigation, customers are falling off toilets in public washrooms as a result of seat dislodging. And there's heavy duty bolts connecting the seats. So the dislodging is kind of, the cause of dislodging is uh, in question here. It says it is impossible to remove the seat without applying excessive force. And they're believing that potentially it may be maliciously 
um, removed. So do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, that's an interesting uh, case. Uh, however, I would need to see some pictures to get a better understanding. Uh, but again, if the uh, toilet seats are secured in place with bolts, they should not uh, properly tighten, they should not uh, shift. Yes, and for the person that actually submitted this, it's not the first time I hear of um, public washrooms having kind of malicious situations in them um, relating to toilets, actually. So it's very interesting that you bring that up. Very, very interesting. Uh, not only toilets, uh, toilet stall doors. Uh, oh, they can doors. be vandalized or hinges. Uh, there, were, there are a lot of things that can be vandalized in a public uh, washroom. Yes. Okay, I'll move on to the next one. In the course, sorry, in the course of the work you perform, how common is it that you find the cause of a failure event as a result of the product not being used as intended or inferior parts are being used in place of the proper parts? Do you have any suggestions on how the improper use and repair of products can be overcome? So do you, uh, just to start it off, do you find that it's common, how common is it that you find the cause of a failure event is as a result of the product not being used as intended? It's a large percentage of the investigations that I was involved in. Um, as I mentioned earlier, people are buying or renting tools without being familiar with them. Uh, this is when uh, grinders are cutting fingers. Um, I had a, an interesting case involving a kick toe saw. These are special saws designed to cut um, the floor around island, like a kitchen island. And uh, they are very powerful. Um, and uh, that particular model came with the clear instructions how to use and what not to do. And that particular person was kneeling down and he was cutting the floor. And because he was not using it properly, he had his knees cut. We uh, tried to sh cut in a similar uh, setting and we showed that using the same tool, uh, it operates as intended. Uh, in, earlier in the presentation, I mentioned that uh, roto tiller. Uh, roto tillers are very, very powerful machines, uh, although it, it says only five horsepower, that's a lot. It's like five horses, basically. And uh, they're intended to be used forward only. You, you're not uh, supposed to go backwards. Um, and in that particular case, the, the user went backwards, probably he was close to a, a wall or a, a fence. So rather than rotating the rototiller, he uh, went backwards and uh, he, he lost uh, equilibrium and fell and the rototiller went right over him. Uh, it was a typical example of uh, improper use. Yes. So it sounds like it is, it is quite common that um, such, such claims do arise as a result of the improper use of a particular product. And, it, and it's a matter of documenting the evidence, documenting um, kind of the circumstances, but also looking at the components and figuring out, is there any other potential causes of failure or causes of the incident? Um, I was very brief on all my slides, uh, but every investigation that is present, was presented here, it was a complex uh, one. And, uh, uh, we, we looked at every aspect uh, on each particular situation um, to to obtain as much information as possible um, to run the proper testing or analysis uh, to review uh, uh, information available like instructions, manuals, uh, and we were trying to uh, separate opinions from facts. And this is a a lengthy process and we don't want to let any rock uh, un unturned. Yes. Yes, and I think that that's what positions a, a legal action to be um, most 
probably uh, a successful one, probably, if you are making sure that you're not only indicating what is the cause of the failure, but assessing all of the other types of potential causes and disproving them as not being plausible. Is that is that part of your process? Yes, we are looking into uh, depth in every aspect of the yes. our investigation and make sure that uh, um, we provide the correct opinion because based on our opinions, the client will make a decision and people's lives are affected by our decisions. So we have to be very, very careful that we do everything properly and uh, in the, the right way. Yes. Well, that takes up all our time. Thank you so much, Dinu, and thank you all for attending. We have a ton more questions that have been submitted, and, and unfortunately, we've run out of time. We will be getting back to you all on those questions. Um, if you have any other questions before you sign out, you could just submit them, and we'll get back to you. A lot of people are sending their thank yous uh, in, the, in, the, in the question box. Thank you all for joining us. It was a pleasure to have you. Take down the information that you see on your screen now, Dinu's contact information. Um, and uh, stay safe and hope that you'll join us for our next webinar. Thank you all, have a great day. Thank you all.